In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our beloved fathers, deacons, nuns, and faithfuls, both who are present in this holy church, and all of our beloveds who are watching us for live streaming, I pray that the Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one in nature, one in essence, Bless you all, guide you, protect you, and deliver you from the snares of the enemy, whether it be visible or in invisible. In Jesus' mighty name, we all pray, amen. Um, the gospel for today's liturgical service is according to St. Luke, and our church fathers have uh, taken... Uh, one part from chapter 16 and another part from chapter 17 of the gospel according to St. Luke and more specifically and precisely it is Luke 16 from verses 19 till the end of chapter 16 which is verse 31 and then chapter 17 from verses 1 to 10 inclusive. So it is Luke 16 19 to 31 the end of the chapter and then Luke 17 verses 1 to 10 inclusive The Lord gave us a parable today And when we look at the synoptic Gospels being Matthew Mark and Luke Between the three Gospels we see the Lord has said many parables between the three synoptic Gospels but the uniqueness of today's gospel, it is an actual real one. The reason being, the Lord is mentioning a person's name. See, one thing about the Lord Jesus definitely is he never makes up stories. He never makes up a name. He never makes up a story. So when the Lord mentions there was a poor man called Lazarus that means literally Lazarus existed in Israel at some time in history so this parable is unique in this sense that it is an actual event it is not something that the Lord is trying to bring to a closeness or bring it to a simplistic way for the audiences to enable them hearing it in a simple term and an easy way. See an example, uh, when you read in Matthew, Mark and Luke and other parables, the Lord is talking about the sower going out to sow some seeds. This is a parable, but this one is an actual story and actual people and he called them by their names. The Lord's spoken parable for three reasons. One, to fulfill prophecies. Secondly, to make the story as easy, as simple as possible to the audiences. And three, in that parable, he is telling you a secret, indirectly asking you to search for the answer and to search for the truth. There was a certain rich man who was dressed up in purple and linen and lived a life of luxury and at the front door of that rich man laid a poor man called Lazarus he had sores and even dogs came and licked them all of his life he lived in a very difficult way Lazarus but the rich man lived a very luxurious way both of them at some stage died and the Holy Bible says that the rich man was buried he died and was buried but the poor Lazarus when he died the angels took him to the bosom of our father Abraham so the rich man died and was buried but the poor man poor Lazarus he died also but he was taken by the angels into the bosoms of our father Abraham and since the Lord mentioned the name of Lazarus as we said it is a true story it is an actual one a real one. 
What is the Lord trying to send a message today to all of us, my beloved? The Lord is trying to say this, that if anyone decides to choose to live an easy life, a luxurious life, a life where they can do whatever, however, whenever, with whomever, the Lord says, whatever luxury life you choose to live, i.e. living for the world and being part of the world, you will find your pleasures on earth, but definitely your pains and sorrows and suffering in the next. But if you choose to live a life of poorness, a life of rejection, a life of pain and sorrows, for the Lord's sake in this world, definitely you will find peace and glory in the next. When this rich man found himself in Hades, burning, he looked up and he saw the poor Lazarus, whom he saw every single day when he left home. He saw this poor man laying at his front door, yet he did nothing for that poor man. He showed no mercy, he showed no compassion, he showed no help. He passed him by on the way out and on the way in to his house and as if he never existed. He looked up and saw Lazarus he saw the reverse of that cycle. The rich man is poor and the poor man is rich. He looked up and said, Father Abraham, please, can you send Lazarus? I am burning here, even with his little finger. If he dips it in the water, I just need a drop of water. I'm burning. Quench my thirst. Our father Abraham answered that rich man and said, he said, remember, you had your luxurious lifestyle while on earth and Lazarus, his pain and sorrows and sufferings. Therefore, it is time for you to suffer and Lazarus to be comforted. Secondly, there is a big kind of a valley between us and you. Neither us can we come, on, come to you nor you can come to us. The rich man didn't give up. He said, okay, if you cannot send Lazarus to me, then I beg you, Father Abraham, send him to my father's house on earth. I have five brothers. I want to go and preach to them, lest they not come where I am burning in Hades. Father Abraham replied and said, they have Moses and the prophets, i.e. the Holy Bible. They have Moses and the prophets, the Holy Bible. Let them adhere to the Holy Bible. They will not come where you are. He said, but Father Abraham, it is totally different when somebody comes back from the dead. It is much more powerful. It is much more effective when they see somebody coming back from the dead and proclaiming the good news. Abraham, our father, said, if they do not believe in Moses and the prophets, i.e., if they do not believe in the Holy Bible, neither will they believe even when somebody comes back from the dead. And so true, even when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, they still did not believe and became stubborn. And what did they say? His disciples stole the body while the guards were asleep. The stubbornness of the human fallen corrupt nature still doesn't want to admit what is right and what is wrong. My beloved, whether a human being lives in luxury on earth or lives in suffering on earth, both is temporal. Whether we live happy, whether we live in pain, whether we live in comfort, whichever way we live, it is both temporal. Everything on earth changes. Everything on earth is temporal. 
everything that is tangible is temporal so even if I live in luxury even if I live in fame it is temporal my beloved what matters is the end not the beginning what matters is the end of the human being you see if you say I live comfortably it is only temporary and if you say I live in a lot of discomfort it is also temporary but what matters the most is the focus at the end result when the spirit leaves the body where are we going to be that's what matters because once the spirit leaves the body we are into the eternal realm that never ceases never ceases we look around us in the 21st century as we speak now everything has become so difficult I cannot afford as a new couple I cannot afford to buy a house anymore it is too expensive at home the interest rates have gone up commodities everything's gone up I used to buy groceries for $200 now $600 and it's not enough bills have gone up commands have gone up demands have gone up but my wage hasn't gone up so it's a struggle what happens at home between the family frictions begins one of the partners will come to the other whether it's a husband or a wife regardless same thing they're the same they'll come and say you see before we were able to afford to go on holidays now we cannot before we were able to buy a new car every two years now we cannot before we were spending so much money now we cannot before the birthday party we spent so much on it but now we cannot therefore you need to do something and then each one starts blaming the other and before we know it it is world war three erupting at home and when you are going through this kind of emotion there is pressure from every angle there is struggle from every corner there is arguments happening when are you going to have that peace of mind and that inner peace for you to find time for God you see that is exactly what the enemy is trying to do is to keep you chasing the mirage of this world but it's a mirage when we get too entangled with materialism guess what it will never end but one thing we are forgetting because of the busyness of lifestyle our life will end on earth because that is also temporal here so what have we achieved I've been running doing eight hours then on to 12 hours on to 16 hours a day finding a second job a third job if I can squeeze it somewhere in one little corner and now there is no time for God because I am so busy I am so overwhelmed I am so heavy burdened I don't have the time anymore neither for God nor for me nor for my family so many people chased the world and chased the pleasures of the world chased the fame of the world and ended up dead and buried what have they gained absolutely nothing gone as if that person never existed on earth the moment the spirit leaves the body as if that human being never came never lived never walked never talked never shared their life with me as if this was all a dream at the awakening and it is so a dream at the awakening but you see this other man 
was Paul. He struggled every single day of his life. But you know what? He didn't perish. He didn't die. He ended up in the bosoms of our father Abraham at the end of that suffering life that he had on earth. So many times we make decisions that are irrational. So many times we make decisions that are not thought of very well. You see, we think happiness is in wealth. We think happiness is in health. We think happiness is in fame. We think happiness is in power. We think happiness is in riches of this world. But we're not realizing that these are nothing but chains chaining us to the ground and not letting us breathe. We become enslaved to what God has given us at our disposal. This rich man, all he thought of was to be richer and richer and richer. At the end, all he had for himself is a little grave. Nothing else. And this is the reality of this realm. It is just one little grave at the end. This is my true portion of this world. That little grave. But you know what is funny? All the riches of the world and all the empires and their glories, they become nothing when we face death. You know, when the Lord God led the Israelites through Moses, God brought them to this place deliberately. He cornered the Israelite nation. You see, he said to Moses, when they leave Egypt, the Israelite people, let them take the gold and the silver of Egypt. And Egypt was very rich. So they took a lot of gold and silver with them. And they said, wow, we are rich now. We have gold and silver. We can do anything and everything. We have the power now. We have the wealth now. And God brought them deliberately to the Red Sea. And he brought them to a spot where from the right hand and the left hand were mountains. They could not climb up. So right and left blocked. The sea in front of them blocked. Behind them, which is the only exit, the Pharaoh's army is coming to them to slain them all. They became cornered. The first thing they did, they threw away the gold and the silver. <laughs> the first thing they did, they said, what are we going to do with gold and silver? I need to save myself. I don't want to die. Wow. Beforehand, I was killing my brother for the gold and the silver. I was killing him. Now, I don't want the silver and the gold. I just want to live. So many rich people became sick with an illness. All their wealth and all their power and fame could not save them, my beloved. One little illness gone with the wind. The problem and the dilemma of the human race is they are seeking what they believe is the way for their happiness and is the way for their joy and is the way for their success. So they seek money in order to gain power and through power conquering. But at the end of the day, all of us are mortals. Sooner or later, whether we like it or not, we have to leave this world. What are we going to take with us when we leave this world? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Then my beloved, we need to learn to let God to define for us what is good and what is bad. We need to trust in the Almighty God to give us what is good for us and what is not good for us. Let God 
be the one who leads our life and give us the way he sees it fit for every single one of us. Who said to you that wealth is good? Who said to you that health all the time is good? Who said to you success always is good? This is the way you and I perceive it, but it is not the way God sees it, my beloved. Because a lot of times success can be extremely dangerous wealth can be extremely dangerous and health can be extremely dangerous if we are not aware of God's presence in our life always you know when we're healthy we may remember God but at a surface level the moment we get sick we de we dive deep we dive deep our prayers change our perspective of life changes everything changes in us because when I am sick I am facing death and when it comes to death I'll drop everything for the sake of gaining that life once again but when I was healthy it was so easy for me to gossip about people it was so easy for me to chop their heads behind their back and stab them in the back but when I got sick and taken to hospital I stopped all of that and I was seeking one thing God Please have mercy on me and give me my health back. I don't want anything, God. I'm happy with the bicycle. I'm happy with the granny flat. I'm happy with that little shed. I'm happy with everything, God. As long as, please, God, I want to die. Please, God, I don't want to die. Well, why don't you behave like that all the time? Why don't you be a good boy and a good girl all the time? Why does it take? An illness why does it take a tragedy for you to wake up why 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 the problem is when I focus on me that's when all hell breaks loose when I focus on me it's me it's either my way or you hit the highway, brother. And I won't even give you the sabufa khabibi in the back seat. So there is no wa'a wa'a dov dov. I will wa'a wa'a you. When I go through some trouble, all of a sudden, I'm not interested in any topics. Before, my friend used to come quite often and he would bring me news, updates me with what's happening in, in, the, in the hood, brother. So he would come and say to me, did you know so-and-so just got divorced? Oh, really? Why? Oh, you have no idea what she did. And that guy, what shame. He divorced, he was already with someone else straight away. Imagine you say that to someone facing a court case facing death what are they going to say please go away i don't want to hear nothing don't talk about nothing all i want pray for me everyone is a saint i'm the only sinner wow imagine we do that all the time we become saints we become saints what is the definition of richness and poorness in the sight of god one thing, he who has the Son has life eternal. But he who does not have the Son has the wrath of God, the wrath of God upon him. You want to be found rich in the eyes of God? Make Jesus Christ your portion. You want to be poor in the sight of God? Make Satan your portion. You want to chase the world? Well, the world at the end is going to give you one thing, a grave. And in that grave, every bone is rotted. And that grave is full of termites, worms, eating away from that body, which I gave it every lustful thing. But at the end, everything was nothing but one big lie. One big lie, my beloved, because this is the world. The world is a place where people act upon people and lie to one another. This is the world. 
This is the world. Come will make you healthy. Come when well, will make you wealthy. But there is a huge price to pay at the end. And it'll be a tag attached to you for the rest of your life till you go to the grave. And on that tag, there will be one word, slave, slave, slave. The world will make you a slave. But look at the Lord Jesus. He said, I am the truth. And when you find the truth, the truth shall set you free. No more slavery. You'll be free. I have told you this story. Maybe some of you have, have heard it, some haven't. True story, my beloved, of a beggar, a street beggar, a true, true story. This street beggar had no arms, no legs. He was born like that. No arms, no legs. They used to carry him and put him on the side of the road. He would beg for money and that he did for many years. One day, this, this street beggar who had no arms and no legs, he sent somebody to speak to a specific priest. So this person came and said, Father, there is someone that wishes to see you. And this is the address. So the priest, the following day he goes, uh, looking for this address, he comes to this little hut, opened, just a little hut, no doors, no window, nothing, 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 a little hut. And then he walks in, he sees somebody sitting there with no arms and no legs. And in the middle, there was a piece of cloth tied up. He said, oh, hello, Father. Thank you very, very much for, you know, coming to my, to my calling. He said, please take a seat, Father. He said, what can I do for you, son? He said, Father, do you see this, uh, this cloth bag here? He said, yes, son. He said, I... I collect money, I beg, I'm a beggar. I collect the money and now I have enough. Please, Father, if you can take it and give it to the poor. True story. The priest is telling the story himself. The priest is telling the story himself. He said, I thought I had faith. He, I thought I knew the Lord Jesus. He, he said, I thought I sacrificed for the Lord Jesus. This man blew me away with his faith. I was put to shame by the power of this faith. He said, I was dumbfounded. I was speechless. I couldn't reply. I couldn't say a word. I was just numb. I took the bag and I distributed to the poor people, knowing fully there is no one poorer than you, my dear friend. You are the poorest of all. And you are begging for money to give to the poor? He said he would send after me every month, every six weeks. Come and collect the bag, Father. One day I went to collect the bag. He said, Father, today is the last day I'm going to give you this bag. Because tomorrow the Lord has taken me to him. He said, the Lord came just before you came, Father. He came in person, no dream, no nothing. In person, he walked the Lord into that little hut. He said, my son, on earth, you carried the cross for me. On earth, you suffered like the poor Lazarus suffered. On earth, you were rejected. On earth, you were not even known. On earth, probably people spoke badly about you. On earth, some walked by and laughed at you. Some people ridiculed you. Maybe some people threw the money in your face. Whatever, but you carried the cross faithfully and loyally. And you collected that money day in and day out to feed the poor. Yet you were the poorest of all those poor. On earth, you had no legs and no arms. But my son, I'm telling you, tomorrow I will give you the wings of an eagle and you will soar in the heaven of all heavens for me. He said, Father, I won't be here tomorrow. My Jesus came and he's taken me home and he's going to give me legs that I can run faster than a gazelle and he is going to give me the wings of an eagle. I'll put everyone to shame. Father, take care. Be good. Second day came, he flew home. 
What matters is the end. What matters is the end. People work hard to make something for themselves in order to be able to retire and live a comfortable life. They collect it for the end, not for the beginning. But the issue is, what are we collecting things for? Here, death will take it away from us. But over there, nothing can take it away from us. Nothing. Trust me, my son and my daughter. You are beautiful as you are. You don't need to do any changes to your facial structure. But one thing you need to do, have a change of heart. See, I can change my looks. And I can wear different clothing every single day. But if the heart is not prepared for the Lord, I have labored in vain. Because sooner or later, time will put wrinkles on this face that once upon a time looked so beautiful. Age, time will eat it away. But when I give my heart to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, you make it beautiful. You make it a place for you to dwell in, worthy of your dwelling in. Lord, I give you my heart so that I live with you forever. This is the richness of the man. Even if you may live materialistically poor, but when your heart is for the Lord, you are the richest of all. You are the richest of all. It is not materialism that determines whether you are rich or poor. It is your faith and love for Jesus Christ of Nazareth that determines whether you are rich or poor. So many rich people shall be poor at the end and so many poor people shall be rich in the end. Oh my goodness. It's an empty world if you are chasing it. Don't you ever do that. So beautiful it is when I have money and before I come and eat, I remember somebody starving. Oh, so beautiful, so beautiful. I say, Lord, you're putting food on the table. The food is from the Lord, not from me. The house is from the Lord, not from me. Everything is the Lord's. This body, the soul, the spirit, this life, everything is the Lord's. Everything belongs to Him. Sooner or later, every human being will come to this realization. Those who believe there is no God, <laughs> they will get the shock of their life. And those who believe Jesus Christ is not God, they will also get the shock of their life. Because when they go to heaven, they will not. Let me say this again with all love and respect. I'm not judging. I'm not attacking. Let me tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is God, who is the truth. I've been to heaven and I've seen heaven. There is no one that is going to welcome you into heaven except Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why? Because he is the rightful owner of heaven and everything in it. Because he has created heaven and created this realm and created every human being. Whether you are a Christian or not, I'm talking about people. He has created everything, visible and invisible. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the truth. There is nothing else outside of that. Nothing. And you know, when you see heaven, you'll be blown away by the beauty of heaven. But when Jesus Christ shows up, he overrides the beauty of heaven. He's more beautiful. In fact, I won't say he's more beautiful. No, no, I'll take that back. In fact, he makes heaven beautiful. It's his presence that makes heaven beautiful. He's just one amazing figure. One amazing figure. Man, we are naughty. 
Men, we are naughty. Men, bro, we are naughty. Yo, bro, what's up? We're giving away on this heaven. Who is Christ? The King. For the sake of some dark alley, some little plastic bag with white powder in it, some pleasures, some moment that fades away like that. And going against this person and that person, talking bad about this person and that person, chasing the thrones, even in the church. We're fighting over a chair. And I can make this in China very cheap. Mr. Hang Zeng Wing will make it for me very cheap. We're fighting over thrones. And then we come back and say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What Jesus? What Jesus? By the way, if you are chasing the true Jesus, the real figure, the real perfect God, perfect man who walked on earth, let me tell you, my dear church leader, maybe it's a bit of a shock, but we should all know it by now, I guess, uh, otherwise we're in trouble. The real Jesus, my dear church leader, was a beggar on earth. If you are truly seeking the true Christ, you better be a street beggar as well. You better walk barefooted and you better go and sit at the gutter and you better put your sleeves up and get the broom and start sweeping the floor. Stop walking on red carpet, sitting in limousines and, and making people kiss your hand. This is not the real Jesus. This is not, this is not. If you want to live like a rich man, you'll die and you'll be buried. But if you want to be Lazarus the poor, the angels will take you into the bosom of Abraham. So enough of this nonsense. A true leader is the one that goes and sits where the people are afflicted the most. It is the one who remembers those who are sleeping hungry, waking up hungry. Those who are naked. Those who are rejected. One saint, an archbishop, when they came, he established this charity called Brothers in Christ, reaching out to the poor. When they came and showed him, they said, Father, look, uh, we bought a few things for these poor people. They brought to him, he was sitting in the car, they brought to him a pair of shoes. They were going to hand it out to the poor people. You know what he did? This bishop, this archbishop, this saint, he took those pair of shoes, he kissed them and put them on his head. He said, tell those poor people, my heart is with you. And tears were gushing down his, his face. My heart is with you. You are the living Christ. So I am kissing the shoes that are going to go on the feet of Christ. If we remember those who are suffering, the Lord will remember us when we are suffering. The Lord will remember us when we are suffering. Blessed are those who are merciful for they shall find mercy. Blessed are those who are merciful for they shall find mercy from the Almighty God. You show mercy unto others. I, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God revealed in the flesh, will show mercy on you in this world and in the next on Judgment Day. I remember that one day you fed a hungry tummy. I will come to your rescue on Judgment Day and I will honor you because you have honored my children. The world is a vicious jungle, a strong devours the weak. Jesus Christ came to give life for the weak, to give hope for the weak, to give honor, dignity, identity for the weak. And one last thing I'll say about this parable, which is a true story. The question is now, this rich man went to Hades. He ended up in Hades. Hades means he is separated from God. 
The actual, the true death is when the spirit separates from its creator. So if somebody says when people leave this realm, they are dead, they don't hear us, they don't communicate, they don't talk, that is not true. Read the gospel of St. Luke chapter 16. So this man went into Hades, meaning he is truly dead, the spirit separated from God. Yet, was he dead? No. He is actually conversing with our father Abraham. Secondly, how did he recognize Abraham? Abraham is 2,000 years before the Lord Jesus. This man was at the time of the Lord. How did he recognize Abraham? One. And how did he remember he had five brothers on earth and he was interceding for them? He's not dead. Yet he is in Hades. He's burning. So if the one in Hades is interceding for the well-being of, of his brothers on earth, how much more those who are in paradise in the presence of the Lord Jesus, how much more they are living, how much more they are interceding for our salvation, how much more? But how did he remember? You see, we're made out of body, soul, and spirit. First Thessalonians 5.23, St. Paul says, the human being is made out of body, soul, and spirit. First Thessalonians 5.23. The body went back to earth. That's where it came from. Now, the spirit has no memory. The spirit remembers nothing. So what has the memory? The soul. The soul made out of five components. The conscience mind, the subconscious mind, the will, feelings and emotions, and the thought. These are what make up the soul. Now, the subconscious mind is your memory. So for this man to be in Hades and remembering his brothers on earth, that means the soul and the spirit are together. Because the spirit never dies, so as the soul. So he remembered and he's interceding. Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers to warn them not to come where I am. So if he's in Hades interceding, how much more the saints in paradise intercede? There is no death, my beloved. If there is anyone dead, it's us on earth while in the flesh. For as long as we're in the flesh, we are susceptible to making mistakes. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. And let me tell you this last thing about Abraham. Abraham represents here the Holy Trinity. See, when you go back to the original language, the original name. Now, Abraham came from the land of Iraq, Mesopotamia, Babylon. I was born in Iraq. By birth, I am an Iraqi. The land of the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. Abraham spoke Aramaic, the Lord's language, our language, or some people refer to it as Syriac, no hard feelings. So when you go to the name in that original language, initially it was made out of four letters, Abram, Abram, Alab, equivalent as the letter A, Beth, B, Resh R Mim M Abram. When the Lord God came and spoke to him, and he said, You need to leave your land, your country, your people, and all of them. Come, I'll show you the promised land. Abram believed in the voice of God and followed through with that voice of God. God came and gave him the fifth letter, He, as in H. It became, his name became five letter word. And the number five, biblically speaking, represents blessings. And when you read in the Old Testament, God says to Abraham, I will bless the people through you and I'll make you a blessing. Because now your name is made out of five and five is blessing. The first letter, Alab in Aramaic Syriac. Alab or A stands for God the Father. Beth, B, stands for God the Son. 
Resh R stands for God the Holy Spirit. Then M Mim for Ma'amodita, Holy Baptism. And H He for Haymanuta, Faith. So Abraham is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Baptism, Holy Baptism, Faith. When you have faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and you get baptized in this name by, by faith, you are the Son of the Kingdom. You are in the bosoms of Abraham, in the bosoms of the Holy Trinity. Even if you were poor on earth, but in the eyes of God, you are the richest of all. You are the heir to the throne and the child of the kingdom. You descend from the royal family. Your father is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. You are a king and a queen in his presence. Love the Lord Jesus. Seek the Lord Jesus. And ask the Lord what he wishes to do in your life. The other day, a question was sent to me. And it was directed at me. And the question said, Bishop Murray, what changed in your life after the incident? What changed in your life after the incident? And I'll leave you with it. I said, without thinking about it, or even blinking twice about it, I said one thing, my dear, definitely has changed. My love for my sweetheart, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That changed after the incident. Prior to the incident, if I had loved him once, after the incident, I love him a million, zillion times moreover. Because it matters not what we go through. What matters is to be with him at the end. Is to be with him at the end. Be with the Lord, my beloved. Come to church all the time. Don't ever say, I'm too busy, I'm too tired, I'm not up to it, I feel empty, I feel cold, I feel disconnected, I am a sinner. I don't care what you feel, come. You don't follow the Lord Jesus with your feelings, you follow the Lord with your faith. Faith, not feelings. Feelings are like a yo-yo. One day you are summer, the next you're winter. One day you have plenty of leaves, the next you are barren, autumn. So are you going to go with feelings? You'll be up and down all the time. You need to walk with faith, steady, straight line, steady. You just come as you are. Just come the way you are. The only time you feel ashamed, the only time you feel ashamed is not when you make a mistake is when you don't do anything about that mistake. That is a shame. Yes, you made a mistake. Good, fine, get up, dust it off and be a man, even if you're a woman. And I'm not talking about LGBTQ or you be a man. Shake it, dust it off and walk straight to the Lord and say, Lord, I have stuffed up. I have sinned. I have done this and I have done that. I'm, I'm admitting Lord Jesus. I'm confessing before you because nothing is hidden from you. You know everything before I even know it. You know me more than me. Therefore, Lord, I am saying to you, forgive my sins which I am aware of and those which I am not aware of. Both forgive them, Lord. But I'm coming to you, Lord. Satan can try but my Jesus is already triumphant and crushed the head of the serpent long time ago on Calvary the battle is won the battle is finished we are fighting a defeated enemy already are you gonna let him get on your nerves be gone Satan in the 21st century terminology get lost Satan in Jesus mighty name but the best thing you do a bit of a secret don't enter a conversation with the enemy just ignore him 
See, when you enter a conversation, you've given him a place and a spot now. You've acknowledged him. So he's going to come and say, let's have a cup of tea together. So whatever happens, you talk to the Lord, ignore Satan. Yeah? So Satan has made you fall into sin. You go, don't go at Satan and say, oh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to fix you. No, don't do that. He'll come even stronger. So go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Satan is trying hard. I'm here. I'm here. Talk. No, no, just ignore. Always talk to the Lord. Ignore Satan. He comes and makes a big deal. Just, Lord, I love you. Have mercy on me, Lord. Be close to the Lord Jesus. Amen. Be close to the Lord Jesus. Amen to that. Um, so don't worry whether you are rich or poor. Be rich in the Lord. Richness is not measured by materialism. Richness is measured by how much love you have for Christ. Amen. Very good. Let us bow our heads and ask the Lord Jesus to have mercy on all of us. Forgive us our sins and debts and wrongdoings and make us worthy to come forth and receive him in the true body and blood of Christ, the Savior and the Redeemer of the world. Amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit, by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion, from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the walks of their behavior and the paths of righteousness please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith and the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will to confess worship and praise your holy name the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen.